Tonight at 10, Boris Johnson becomes the first sitting Prime Minister to be found to have broken the law. Both he and the Chancellor have been fined and have apologised for breaching Covid rules at a Downing Street party for Mr Johnson's birthday during lockdown. In all frankness, at that time, it did not occur to me uh, that this might have been a breach of the rules. But of course the police have found otherwise and I fully respect the outcome of their investigation. They've dishonoured their office and then he lied repeatedly to the public about it. Britain deserves better. They have to go. Neither man has offered his resignation and some cabinet ministers have signalled their support. But what do voters think? It just made me so angry. It's like one rule for them and one for us. You do a point resigning, pay the fine and just get on with it. And they obviously don't do it again. Ukraine and Russia continue to build up their forces in the east ahead of a major escalation of the war here. We're with Ukrainian troops as they prepare for a fresh Russian onslaught. And ordinary lives transformed by an extraordinary war. We follow the fortunes of one suburban Ukrainian family. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel, Good evening from Downing Street, where, as you can probably hear, there is a protest going on as the two most senior members of the government, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, have been fined by the Metropolitan Police for breaching lockdown rules. It makes Boris Johnson the first ever sitting Prime Minister to have broken the law. This evening, Mr Johnson apologised for his behaviour and confirmed that he had paid the fine, which was for attending an event in celebration of his birthday in June 2020. His wife, Carrie, who was also there, has also paid the fine. When asked if he would resign, Mr Johnson said he was focused on delivering for voters. This evening, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, also apologised and said he deeply regretted the frustration and the anger caused. But opposition leaders, including Labour and the SNP, have called on both men to step down. And at Westminster, there are demands from all the opposition parties for Parliament to be recalled from its Easter break. Here's our deputy political editor, Vicky Young. We all have images we remember from lockdown. The Queen forced to sit alone at her husband's funeral. But for many in Downing Street, it was different. Drinks in the office and garden, dancing in the basement. And now police have decided that the wrongdoing went right to the top. Today, the Prime Minister apologised, but said he wouldn't resign. I understand the anger that many will feel that I myself fell short when it came to observing the very rules which the government I lead had introduced to protect the public. And I accept in all sincerity that people had the right to expect better. And now I feel an even greater sense of obligation to deliver on the priorities of the British people. But you did repeatedly say that all the guidelines were followed in Downing Street. That was a lie, wasn't it? Uh, when I said that, uh, I spoke in completely good faith because, as I've said to you just now, I, at the time that I was standing up for uh, nine minutes in the, in the cabinet uh, room where I work every day, it didn't occur to me that I was... But you didn't uh, understand your own the, rules and everyone uh, else had to follow to them. It didn't occur to me that, uh, uh, as I say, that uh, I was in breach of the rules. I now humbly accept that, that, that I was. Uh, Happy birthday to you. This was the day Boris Johnson broke his own rules, June 2020, his birthday. It started with a school visit. That was allowed. But later there was a gathering in the cabinet room in Downing Street. Carrie Johnson turned up. She's also been fined. Today the Prime Minister explained that he'd had a busy day. The occasion lasted less than 10 minutes and it didn't occur to him at the time that he'd done anything wrong. The Chancellor Rishi Sunak was also there for a meeting and tonight offered an unreserved apology. In a statement he said, I understand that for figures in public office the rules must be applied stringently in order to maintain public confidence. I respect the decision that has been made and have paid the fine. I deeply regret the frustration and anger caused and I am sorry. 
This is an extraordinary moment. A Prime Minister standing here in Chequers admitting he's broken the law. And this wasn't some insignificant rule. These were rules that kept families and friends apart for months, stopped people going to funerals. But in the darkest hours for some people, the atmosphere in Downing Street was very different, where people time and again broke the laws that they drew up. And for many, this is unforgivable hypocrisy. Labour's leader says for the Prime Minister and Chancellor, the game is up. This is the first time in the history of our country that a Prime Minister has been found to be in breach of the law. And then he lied repeatedly to the public about it. Britain deserves better. They have to go. The police investigation isn't over yet. They're looking into a long list of events in Downing Street and other government buildings. More than 50 fines have now been issued and there could be more. And these words could come back to haunt the Prime Minister. I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that, and that no Covid rules were broken and that is what I have been repeatedly assured. Political opponents say it's damning. If you mislead Parliament, if you lie to Parliament, then you resign. There's no ifs, there's no buts. We know that this Prime Minister has lied to Parliament. He should be offered his resignation. I am absolutely clear now they must go, they must go immediately so we can get fresh leadership. And if Conservative MPs won't do that, I feel they are directly associated with this wrongdoing. Tonight, Boris Johnson has received backing from his cabinet and, more importantly, Tory MPs who just a few weeks ago were trying to oust him after months of damaging lockdown allegations. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Well, as you heard there, the Prime Minister tonight said that at the time of the party, it didn't occur to him that he had breached the rules. Our home editor Mark Easton takes a look now at how those rules worked and what happens when they're broken. It was Boris Johnson and his government, of course, that devised and introduced the Covid regulations, far-reaching restrictions that had a profound impact on the lives, livelihoods and liberties of every citizen. Before anyone knew about Partygate, around 120,000 fixed penalty notices had been issued to people for breaching the rules, fined anything from £50 to £10,000. Commissioner, why are you now investigating the Downing Street Scotland Yard were initially reluctant to investigate alleged breaches that had occurred months earlier, but official revelations forced their hand. There was evidence that those involved knew or ought to have known that what they were doing was an offence. Now more than 50 fixed penalty notices have been issued and there may well be more to come. Each of the fixed penalty notices requires the police to believe that a criminal offence has been committed. Now it doesn't go on anyone's criminal record but it could go on the police national computer. Hello sweetheart. While ordinary people Hello. were denied the chance to hold the hands of the dying or provide comfort and care to the vulnerable, Hello. Boris Johnson, his wife, Chancellor and others were at a party in number 10 eating cake and singing happy birthday. The funeral of 75-year-old Arita Godoy was held on the same day as one of the Downing Street parties, with only a handful of people in attendance. He should resign. Uh, you know, he's been months, months and months saying that it's actually, uh, basically, was never a party, that he was never there, that he wasn't aware of it. How many times can he lie? You know, it's, again, it's, it's a, an insult. In normal times, this would be the end for the Prime Minister. There will be questions as to whether he knowingly misled Parliament. There will be accusations of hypocrisy. But the biggest risk for Boris Johnson is that he will be seen as having taken voters for fools. And the consequences of that will be judged at the ballot box. Mark Easton, BBC News. Well, there was fury amongst voters when the claims first came out of staff parties in Downing Street and Whitehall during lockdown. Gatherings which allegedly took place while ministers were laying down rules, stopping everyone else from socialising. So how are today's revelations being viewed? Our correspondent Danny Savage has been to the town of Murfield in Kirklees, West Yorkshire, to gauge the mood. Murfield in West Yorkshire, a busy town between Wakefield and Huddersfield which fell silent during lockdown. 
an area of northern England where people we spoke to say they stuck to the rules concerning coronavirus restrictions. They shouldn't have broken the rules anyway, they made them. Everybody else was adhering to those rules and they didn't. I think it should be designed personally, yeah. yeah. I think it should, uh, you know, he's it's, it's, it's asking us to obey one rule and then he's doing something completely different, the opposite. It's, it's just not right, it's not fair, it's not British. No point resigning, pay the fine and just get on with it. And they obviously don't do it again. You stuck to the rules. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they didn't. How, how does that lift leave you feeling? Well, I'm actually angry. I'm angry. I've never in, been into politics, as one can say, but I, it just made me so angry. It's like one rule for them and one for us. But will today's headlines damage the Conservatives in a forthcoming general election? To be fair, the people we spoke to here today weren't sure. But some of their gains in 2019 have very slim majorities, like here, where they won by just over 1,500 votes. What is clear is that Partygate has cut through to people far from Westminster. They're fully aware of it and have firm views. Danny Savage, BBC News, Murfield in West Yorkshire. I'm joined again by Vicky Young. Vicky, this is an extraordinary moment, really, isn't it? And one in which many people might have thought the Prime Minister would step down. Yeah, in some ways, we've got used to so many allegations of rule-breaking here. But actually, this is still an astonishing moment. A Prime Minister who broke the law, the law that he actually drew up. Now, this is damaging for any government. The idea that there was one rule for them and another for all of us. But when it comes to political survival, I think people might be surprised. Until a general election, this is up to Conservative MPs. Tonight, the Cabinet have rallied round, and even some of his fiercest critics on his own side are saying, now is not the time. I think that two months ago, if this had happened, it would have been enough to oust the Prime Minister. But the political wind has changed, partly, of course, because of Ukraine. And for now, I think he survives. Vicky, many thanks. More from you a little bit later in the programme, but for the moment, thank you very much. That is all from me in Downing Street. I will be back at the end of the programme, but I hand you now to my colleague Clive Myrie, who's in Kiev. Rita, thank you for that. Ukraine and Russia are building up their forces in the east of the country here, ahead of a major escalation in the war with a new Russian offensive. Ukraine's President Zelensky says tens of thousands of Russian troops are preparing to attack, with satellite images showing a massive buildup near the border. Now, it comes as Britain and America investigate unconfirmed reports that chemical weapons may have been used by the Russians attacking the southern port city of Mariupol. Moscow says its war aim is the complete liberation of the eastern Donbass region. Kremlin-backed separatists have held significant territory there and the area has been marred by conflict for many years. Well, our defence correspondent Jonathan Beale and cameraman Barnaby Mitchell are in the city of Kramatorsk in the Donbass, travelling with Ukrainian forces and they've just sent us this report. This is where the war in Ukraine will be won or lost the wide open landscape of the east. We went with Ukraine's army to see artillery already firing on Russian forces, nervously watching for signs of Russian aircraft. At their position, American-made Stinger anti-aircraft missiles were ready to fire. The continuing supply of Western weapons will be crucial to their success. Ukraine's military might be smaller, but they've been more mobile. If we stay in one position for more than a couple of days, we usually become the target. But if we fire one or two shells, nothing will happen. Well, these artillery pieces are well hidden. Just hearing some artillery in the distance there. But they are targeting Russian military positions from here, unlike the Russian artillery, which seems to be often targeting Ukrainian towns and cities. Columns of Russian armour have already been spotted moving from the north. Western officials believe Russia is trying to double, even treble, the strength of its military forces here in the east. Ukraine is also having to keep an eye 
on its own population. There's pro-Russian sentiment in this region. Those who they fear may be passing on information to the Russians. This shows they're not just having to worry about Russian armor, a Russian offensive coming in this direction, but they're also having to worry about the enemy within. Uh, it's a job made all the more difficult by the regular threat of Russian airstrikes and artillery. We have to head to a bunker for shelter. There, Victor tells me, they're arresting people nearly every day. We look for bad people who help the enemy. We find them and then hand them over to the intelligence services. Ukraine's already taking casualties. Among the most recent, Tatyana's only child. Alexander, who was killed on the front line. There'll be many more grieving families in the weeks to come. This next phase of the war could be decisive, but it'll also be bloody. Jonathan Beale, BBC News, Kramatorsk. The very latest from the front line in the east there. Well, a delegation representing the world's major religions came to Ukraine today to meet some of the victims of the war. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, was among them. Now, it comes as the Russian Orthodox Church faces widespread condemnation for supporting Mr. Putin and calling the conflict a holy war. Our religion editor, Ali Makbul, travelled with the delegation. It was a remarkable delegation, brought together in a country under siege by a mission to show solidarity. I'm Archbishop Rowan Williams from England. I come with greetings and love and prayers from my brothers and sisters in England, for all of you brothers and sisters here. They told him their stories. It just brings it home heartbreakingly how how many ordinary lives have been totally wrecked by this, this terrible act of aggression. He had strong words about the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church. The fact is that the Patriarchate is becoming increasingly isolated because of its complicity in this criminal aggression. The Patriarch in Moscow has implied Putin's is a righteous war against the forces of an immoral West and so far failed to unequivocally condemn the killing of innocents. Well, so much of Russia's justification for this war has a religious basis. In part, the Kremlin said it was liberating followers of the Russian Orthodox Church here in Ukraine who it claimed weren't free to practice. But of course, Russian Orthodox churches here have been destroyed in the invasion and countless congregants killed. Nikolai Pluzhnik was a Russian Orthodox priest in Kharkiv, but fled the horrors of bombing. He's turned against the Moscow leadership he once followed. When I hear them saying they're protecting us and fighting a holy war, I think they're either blind and don't know what's happening, or they're not serving God but the devil. Today, compassion in the name of God or gods has been on display here. But there are questions about whether faith leaders could do more to put pressure on the Kremlin or on the church supporting it. Aline McBall, BBC News, in Western Ukraine. As Russia prepares for the new offensive, families back home are counting the cost of the war. Thousands of Russian soldiers have been sent to their deaths here in Ukraine, and as the fighting ramps up in the east, many more are likely to lose their lives. Vladimir Putin said in his first comments for some time on the conflict that it would achieve Russia's noble aims and that a clash with Ukraine had become inevitable. Our Russia editor Steve Rosenberg reports now from the city of Stavropol in the southwest of the country. Russia is still claiming there is no war. It can't claim there are no casualties. At the cemetery in Stavropol, there is a new line of graves for elite soldiers killed in what they call here the special military operation.
code for Russia's offensive against Ukraine. The Kremlin has admitted significant losses. Sergei Tisichny was an officer in the paratroopers. His widow, Lara, agreed to talk to me about losing him. I didn't want to believe it. I still don't completely believe it. I've lost one who is dearer to me than anyone else in my life. I know that the whole world is against us now. They'll accuse Russia of anything. But I knew my husband. He would never harm anyone. Dmitry, too, dismisses claims of Russian war crimes as fake news. He used to serve under Sergei. Ukrainian politicians often say thank you to Russia for helping to unite Ukraine. I want to say thank you to all the countries who impose sanctions on us. Thank you for helping to unite Russia behind our Commander-in-Chief and President Vladimir Putin. The messaging is clear. Support the Z, the symbol of the military operation. And through its total control of the media, the Kremlin has persuaded many here to back the offensive and to treat reports of apparent Russian atrocities as disinformation. Ever since Russia attacked Ukraine, I've spoken to so many Russians who've repeated almost word for word what they've been hearing on television. And what they've been hearing on TV is that in Ukraine, Russia is battling Nazis, neo-Nazis, ultra-nationalists, liberating the country from fascism, basically creating a parallel reality. On a visit to Russia's space center today, President Putin claimed his aims in Ukraine were noble and would be achieved. That means his military offensive will continue. Military losses are a tragedy, says the Kremlin, but it's not ready yet for peace. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Stavropol. Well, the enormity of this conflict, the massed armies, the geopolitical consequences, the global ramifications, it can be overwhelming to comprehend all that. But what needs to be understood is that it's mostly ordinary individual families that are ultimately affected. For instance, the people of the town of Bucha, just north of the capital, full of families living everyday lives. They're not activists or politicians, they're just minding their own business. So, along with cameraman David McElveen, I wanted to explore the fortunes of one ordinary family living in an ordinary street, railway station street, in the middle of an extraordinary war. There are some distressing details in my report. An ordinary suburban home. It could be anywhere. But this is Railway Station Street in Bucha, number 17. In the road, remnants of a column of Russian armor that rolled into town on February the 27th and mercilessly attacked by Ukrainian forces. The firefight caused huge explosions, leaving nearby trees bearing strange fruit. I'll tell you what comes to my mind being here is what it must have sounded like. The noise of all these vehicles all along the street just going up. The explosions, the fire, the inferno. It must have been horrible for people hiding in their basements on either side of the street. The area is in Ukrainian hands now. But the Russians, who survived the attack back in February and fled, returned a week later. Their pride in peace is all around. This is number 31, Railway Station Street. And on the fence is written the word, people, in the hope the soldiers would be kind. Viktor Herinenko, like most suburban dads, is into DIY except his roof repairs are the result of war damage. One day under Russian occupation, three soldiers came calling, ordering him, his son, and a neighbor off the roof. 
They fired shots into the ground to hurry us up, he tells me. They said they were going to kill us. Then they ordered us to lie face down on the ground, put your pig faces in the dirt, they said. Then they fired some shots close to my head. I could feel the sand that the bullets kicked up touch my hair. Then I heard the soldiers say, we can get rid of the two older ones and spare the younger one. Then a third soldier said, no, they were just fixing the roof. Other times they cowered in the cramped vegetable cellar. When they heard the Russians in railway station street. The comfort of normality. It's a prize for civilians in war, just being able to feed the chickens. Especially after what Victor's wife Tanya went through when her menfolk were ordered off the roof. My husband and son stood with their hands up, saying, don't shoot. Woman, stay, they commanded. You go outside, I take you down. So I stood in the yard, and I heard two shots. It was so hard, I thought they were dead. I don't know how I'm going to walk around these streets anymore after everything that's happened. I'll remember the blasts and us hiding and the shrapnel and bullets flying. I can't explain everything I feel I can't explain everything we went through here. And what of her son Roman, just 15, subject of a mock execution? Hey. How will he cope with the horrors he's seen as he gets older? The first corpses I saw were of Russian soldiers, he says. I went outside and I saw the burnt body of a man. He had no head. I'll never forget. This memory will stay with me forever. At the end of March, the Russians retreated from railway station street. But they had parting gifts. I heard several shots from the next street, he says, and people were screaming. It was clear a lot of people were being killed in the final days of the occupation. In Yablunska street, in a school and a nearby apartment. This is Yablunska, or Apple Tree Street, today. And this is how the Russians left it. How does a community, a nation, recover from collective trauma? Perhaps the only solution for the residents of Railway Station Street is time. My sincere thanks to the Herinenko family there. So humble, decent, honest people, just caught up like so many others in this war that is nothing to do with them. Some of the residents who managed to escape the fighting in Bucha are beginning to return. Now the Russians have gone to rebuild their homes and their lives and maybe even their faith in humanity. That's it from me and the team in a very windy Kiev. Now back to you, Rita, in Downing Street. Clive, thank you very much. Police in New York City are searching for a gunman who threw smoke grenades and opened fire on a subway train in Brooklyn. 16 people were injured, 10 of them shot during the attack, which happened during rush hour. Officials say the incident is not being investigated as an act of terrorism. A man has been convicted of the murder of his partner's three-year-old son, Kamani Watson Darby. The toddler died from abdominal injuries in West Bromwich in June 2018. Nathaniel Pope will be sentenced in May, along with Kamani's mother, Alicia Watson, who was found guilty of causing or allowing the death of a child. 
the Scottish Green Party has launched its manifesto for next month's local elections. The co-leader, Lorna Slater, said the Greens would bring to local authorities the same focus on the climate and social justice that the party had delivered at Holyrood, where they're in power with the Scottish National Party. And Chelsea looks set to be out of the Champions League with a few minutes left to play after a remarkable night in Madrid to make it 5-4 to Real Madrid on aggregate. Well, I'm joined now for a last word on our main story by our deputy political editor, Vicky Young. Vicky, huge news tonight. Um, how, but how secure is Boris Johnson? Well, look, there are some who will never forgive him, people who made sacrifices, who followed the rules, only to discover that he, his wife, many of his staff didn't do that. It will be regarded as hypocrisy of the worst kind. But is it at the moment, it's his MPs that matter, and they're on side. Why is that? It's partly timing. The Ukraine war, many of them think this is not the moment to get rid of a leader. You need an alternative. It's not clear that they have an alternative leader, especially with the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, having his own problems. There is still danger ahead, though. The May elections. Tory MPs will next spend the next few weeks going around, talking to voters day in, day out. They may not like the feedback they're getting, so the danger could still be there for them. Vicky, many thanks. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, there. Well, that's it from us. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Have a very good night. Bye-bye.